Keith is um, about to present next on swimming. Um, I think we can all recognise that black pool. Hopefully we can. Um, Keith's been, been a, a frequent uh, attender of splash conferences and talks and so on and presenter. Um, and he's currently, well, you retired now, but you're doing a PhD in, well, you'll tell us when I'm about that. Okay, over to Keith. Okay, thank you. Um, for the last two years, um, I've been examining uh, the social and cultural uh, history of, of uh, swimming, specifically within uh, Victorian Lancashire as part of uh, PhD submission. Uh, a major developing theme uh, seems to relate to the influence Lancashire's mill towns and holiday resorts had upon swimming's growth and development uh, as a commercially organised spectator sport. Uh, this paper examines the art of peer diving. Um, so who were these uh, commercial swimmers and uh, divers and what led them uh, to earn a living at the end of the pier? There are a number of common themes. They came from working class backgrounds and they were neither amateurs by profession or education. There was often a family association with swimming which provided opportunities for female participation. As individuals, they displayed common traits valued in Victorian society of self-worth and self-belief that combined to make them driven individuals with a desire for self-improvement. The feats they performed were dangerous when combining cold tidal waters with the height of the dive. This was often compounded by such feats as cycling off the pier or jumping when tied up in a sack. They were entrepreneurs selling their special talents in the new leisure world of the late Victorian and Edwardian eras. They took advantage of niche markets, creating a commercially organised spectator sport. Manufacturers were, now, were not slow to see the potential for advertising their products at such events. The Lancashire holiday resorts of Blackpool and Southport have a strong connection with pier diving from the 1860s to the late 1920s, but this was an activity that took place almost wherever there was a seaside pier. Time restrictions have limited this paper to exploring the feats of Lancastrians. The famous Finney family uh, took advantage of the pier diving concept to promote their more profitable performances on stage or in the swimming baths. Their end of the pier show was taken around the country and was but one arm of their aquatic commercial enterprise. In Southport, the pier played, uh, the pierhead played host to a great many performers who essentially produced standard shows involving diving from a height off the pier, cycling off the pier, and performing ornamental swimming feats whilst in the sea. The pier acted as a natural vantage point for spectators. Professor Bert Pousey was the resident performer at Southport. He had a small commercial empire with other members of the family performing in Brighton and Margate during the season, all being sponsored by Bovril and the Rudge Whitworth Bicycle Company. Liverpudlian Tommy Burns represents a branch of diving that remained uh, in the shadows of respectability, largely due to the sensationalist feats uh, that he performed, chiefly for wages. Burns provided his audiences with stunts that put his life in danger every time he performed, his approach eventually pro uh, proving to be fatal in 1897 when he was just 30 years of age. Burns came to diving through the most unconventional route in that he was formerly a runner and walker of average ability who was unable to get backers uh, of any real note. His solution was to incorporate walking and running, his walking and running abilities with that of his great love of swimming and diving. Burns first came to national recognition in October 1889 at the age of 22 when he took a dive off Runcorn Bridge. Not only did he dive 80 feet into the water, uh, the River Mersey, but he then swam 18 miles to Liverpool, where he then prepared himself to run to London. Having reached London, he dived off London Bridge and then ran back to Liverpool. Uh, the wager stipulated that this must be done in nine days. He not only won the bet, but he also secured willing backers, 
free publicity and the title of champion diver for the rest of his short but eventful life. The Runcorn dive was the first of many such dives over the next eight years that would attract not only a paying audience but also the attention of the authorities. His most common diving platform was any bridge structure anywhere in the country. With every foolhardy dive his popularity grew with the general public who took him to be their working class hero. The police were far more concerned about threats to public order than they were to personal safety. The main irony being that Burns died performing a dive at a licensed venue, namely the Pier Head at Rill. Unfortunately, the response of the authorities led Burns to take ever more risks in his performances. Burns and his backers must have reasoned that diving from a bridge would be far more financially profitable if executed from a moving train. In January 1897, Burns took a train over the Tay Bridge and at a suitable point he climbed onto the roof of the carriage and dived off. The, re the audience of 3,000 people were most impressed but Burns had to be rescued from the water because it was so cold. Uh, on Tuesday the 6th of July 1897 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon Tommy Burns took his last dive. The circumstances leading up to the fatal dive are typical of the chaos and lack of concern of personal safety he had, that had become Burns' trademark. The coroner's inquiry served two purposes, to find the cause of death and to assure the public uh, that swimming on the beach at Rill uh, was a safe place to be. The coroner declared as much in his opening statement. Many of the eyewitness accounts paint a picture of a very tired and perhaps drunk Tommy Burns, who really was not a fit physical or mental state to perform. The most telling and reliable witness account came from Police Inspector Williams. He describes how the deceased had fallen on his back. Upon resurfacing, he attempted to swim for the shore, uh, but was soon became, quote, distressed. It was only then that uh, assistance was rendered to him. The jury returned a verdict of accidental death by drowning. The account of Burns hitting the water on his back is most telling. His style of diving had been questioned four years earlier, in March 1893, when he appeared at the Royal Westminster Aquarium. These two images show a similar technique. The sketch shows Burns landing on his back, in a tank at the aquarium, splashing water over many of the spectators. The picture shows the same technique being used by Burns on his last dive off the pier head of Brill. Um, the swimming career of Baker born David Billington provides an insight in the, into the consequences of the dogmatic stance that was being taken by the Amateur Swimming Association on the amateur question. Billington had been a, a model uh, amateur champion swimmer from 1899 to se September 1905. His amateur record was excellent and promised much for the 1906 Olympic Festival and the 1908 Olympic Games. On the 10th of September 1905, 20-year-old Billington swam in the annual River Seine race, which was a commercial event organised by a leading Paris newspaper. The race was swum in heats, according to the gender and the swimming status of, these, of the individuals. For example, uh, the Australian Miss Annette Kellerman was in a heat of her own as she was a professional female swimmer. The second heat had professional male swimmers in it and the best amateur swimmers were in the next heat, which included Billington. Thus the status of the amateur swimmers was supposedly assured by such arrangements. The ASA took a dim view uh, of Billington entering the race and they immediately declared him to be a professional swimmer. Despite an appeal, the ASA declared that by entering the race, Billington had automatically made himself a professional and that was the end of the matter. To Billington's credit, he responded by quietly embarking upon a career as a professional swimmer competing in speed and ornamental swimming and diving with Blackpool's North Pier is his own venue. 
From 1906 to 1922, Billington produced numerous world and national professional records in both open and closed venues. He entertained spectators in theatres and swimming baths. He performed at the end of the North Pier in Blackpool, with the water between the North and the Central Piers becoming his own swimming pool. As Billington's prowess in swimming declined, he turned his attentions to coaching. He toured the world and passed on his knowledge. Um, he was most successful as a coach during his stay in Canada. His final job were, uh, was in Ratcliffe near Berry, where he was the swimming instructor at the Whitaker Street Baths. Billington had uh, shared many top billings on the North Pier with Australian Beatrice Kerr. Miss Kerr, like her compatriot Annette Kellerman, aka the Million Dollar Mermaid, had left Australia in about 1906 in order to earn a living in England in the commercially organised spectator sports of diving and swimming. Kerr and Kellerman embodied the image of the physically fit modern perfect woman of the early 1900s at a time when the physical culture movement was gaining ground. Although Kerr did not hold world records uh, or swim in the Olympics, she was highly regarded as a swimmer and entertainer, becoming a role model for many young women. Her time in England was taken up with giving exhibitions of swimming and diving from her home venue, Blackpool's North Pier. The Lancashire swimming community was sufficiently small enough to be all-inclusive. The stance of the ASA was confusing at times as they allowed professional swimmers to perform in specific sections of an officially sanctioned gala. Many of the best amateur swimmers accepted the existence of professional swimmers and divers, perhaps because they saw this to be their final destination. In 1911, Beatrice Kerr had met T.S. Battersby, the silver medalist in the 1908 Olympic Games uh, for the 1500m freestyle. Uh, after, being, uh, after, meeting Battersby, uh, sorry, after their meeting, Battersby had sent a promotional postcard to, of himself to his excellent friend, Miss Kerr, which re reveals his high regard for those exponents of commercially organised swimming. Battersby writes, Dear Miss Kerr, I promised you last night I would send you a photograph of myself, and here it is. I hope you like it. I think I shall come down to Blackpool after the 440 yards Northern <coughs> Counties Championship. Remember me to Dave Billington. Hope you have had a good season. I remain yours sincerely. On the afternoon of uh, Wednesday the 23rd of August 1911, Miss Kerr had to interrupt her diving and swimming exhibition on the North Pier in order to rescue two boys from drowning. Watched by a large crowd, she abandoned her stage exhibition to perform a real life exhibition of life saving, which was just as enthusiastically received um, by the audience as her aquatic show. <coughs> Having successfully rescued the boys, Miss Kerr returned to the jetty and resumed her performance. Madge Harrison was born in 1893 in Blackburn, Lancashire. Her biography testifies to the key role she played as a troupe performer supporting the stars of the show. Her career in the commercial world of aquatic ent entertainment began when at the age of 18 she moved to Blackpool where she was employed as an aquatic performer at the Blackpool Tower Circus and on the Central Pier. Although she did not headline an act, she was always able to find work as a supporting performer. Her exploits not only brought her a steady regular income, but it also attracted the attentions of a sailor, Walter Croft. It was whilst performing high dives off the central pier that Madge was to meet Walter, who had taken a shine to her. Walter would, take her, uh, would wait for her to come off the pier in order to pester her to go out with him. Eventually she did consent, and after a short courtship, uh, Madge married Walter, and they lived in Blackpool, where they brought up three children. The third child, Dorothy, followed in her mother's footsteps, earning a living in the Blackpool entertainment industry. Dorothy was trained as an actress, dancer, ornamental swimmer, and skater, appearing in many of the pleasure palaces in Blackpool. Diving off piers was not just the preserve of the able-bodied, 
and elite performers such as Professor Osborne of Manchester. War veteran F. Gansby was an accomplished swimmer who called himself the amateur champion one-legged swimmer of the world. In 1904, he had won the first leg, pun intended, uh, of the 440 yards life-saving race for the King's Cup against some of the best amateur swimmers in the country. Despite his major handicap, Daredevil Peggy, as he called himself, was a, ve a very successful aquatic entertainer, spending many summer seasons at Southport and Skegness, uh, diving off the pier head. His feats being memorialised at Southport with a statue sharing pride of place with one of Professor Osborne on his bike. A one-legged casualty of the 1914-18 war entertained day trippers to New Brighton, who had arrived by steamer. He would dive off the pier as the boat docked. The freakish nature of the event and the obvious skill set made this an attractive and prof profitable enterprise. The war veteran's wife collected pennies from the passengers crying, come on now, don't forget the diver. Every penny makes the water warmer. Um, pier diving provided a steady seasonal income for many of the professional swimmers from May to September each year. When combined with a variety of other aquatic venues, it became an attractive option uh, to those leaving the ranks of amateur swimming. The trippers would often pledge their allegiance to their hometown hero by going to see them perform. The daring dives were well received not only for their skill, but also for the high tariff of danger uh, associated with being at the end of the pier. The spectre of mermaids and mermen was ever present. Commercially organised swimming and diving provided entertainment for the masses when on holiday at the seaside or at local carnivals. It traversed the entertainment world from variety theatre to the silent screen and then to the talkies. Annette Kellerman appeared in the 1916 silent movie uh, A Daughter of the Gods which was the first film to cost over a million dollars to produce and contain the first scene of a fully nude female. Excuse Esther me. Williams, who, had, uh, selected for, who was selected for the cancelled 1940 Helsinki Games, was to memorialise the career of Annette Kellerman in the 1952 film The Million Dollar Mermaid. Two minutes, Two minutes. Um, Uh, the male Olympic swimmers also made the transition from amateur swimmer to movie entertainer based upon their feats in the pool. Buster Crabbe won one gold, what, Olympic gold in the 1932 Los Angeles Games. He played Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers and Tarzan. Johnny Weissmuller won five Olympic golds, three in Paris and two in Amsterdam, and played Tarzan and Jungle Jim in the 1930s and 1940s. The promotion of swimming and diving as a commercial activity maintained, maintained public interest in the art of swimming, uh, certainly from the 1870s to the 1920s. It influenced the physical culture movement at the beginning of the 20th century for underrepresented groups such as children and females. It also had an effect on the rate of bass construction, the principle of supply and demand. A, a, a marked improvement in Lancashire women's spending power and the sheer extent and range of commercial entertainment provision in the late Victorian mill towns needs further extensive research. The baths and wash houses built in the Victorian England uh, proved to be commercially viable concerns largely due to the income generated from swimming and swimming clubs. At a time when the ASA is under fire from Sport England over participation figures, it is perhaps <coughs> time for them to reflect on past glories and how we may learn from our illustrious past. In 2014, over 2.6 million adults took part in a weekly swim, make it, making it the highest participation sport for adults in England. But this figure represents a, nearly a quarter of a million drop in the last 12 months. Even more telling is that 40% of children in the UK cannot swim. I would suggest that amateur swimming needs commercially organised swimming now more than ever before.
Greg, Keith, uh, we'll start. We've got a few minutes of questions, so uh, go on.